ahead, tell us a bit about what you're doing. You've now been doing it for 21 years, evolving from <clears throat> using SIPs to using SIPs to now net zero and net positive homes. Um, what, what are you doing? Yeah, well, you know, what really got us to switch over from predominantly stick framing to doing SIPs was a house that we built in Seattle. It happens to be Seattle's first net zero house. Um, it was during the downturn, I think it was 2010, and they had a budget of about 180000 bucks and wanted to build this net zero energy house with SIPs and called me up and asked me if I could do it. I said, well, of course because I didn't have any other work. So um, <laughs> and so we just we went through and we figured out, okay, what do we need to do this? Okay, we need the solar panels, we need the SIPs, we need the triple pane windows. We had our energy calculations, so we knew, we knew what our heat loads were. You know, we, we knew all these parts, and then we, we had to go through and figure out, well, what can we get rid of? And one of the things was, you know, complicated design. We came up with, you know, the house was very simple, rectangular box, you realize every piece of surface area has a price to it. And so every little indentation, every you look at a plus sign, and you're basically paying for a house that would be a rectangle that would encompass that plus sign. And so we started just building with rectangles, um, you know, which work really well with SIPs, easy, planar designs. And then we're like, well, we have this building material that can handle um, handle large spans in different, in different ways. And so we started exploring, well, how do we do that? How do we, how do we make our window sizes so they work with SIPs? I mean, all, you know, value engineered all these details, right? Um, until we got to the point where we're really at cost parity with, um, with typical code minimum construction, with just a few upgrades like the solar um, and, and SIPs cost a little bit more, but what you get out of it, you know, ends up paying back uh, over time. Um, in a pretty compelling way. So we got a video here of a time lapse of a, a project you worked on. Um, do you want to tell us how long this time lapse is beforehand, yeah. or you'll tell us after? Well, let's look. You can kind of see the sunrise and set, and so I haven't. Um, and he's got some great music here that he wanted me to take out because we don't have the rights to it. But I said, who cares about rights? <laughs> There's no one in here who's caring. We, we play music beforehand. So here we go. One of our guys had a GoPro that he set in a tree, and so you can kind of see there's two houses side by side. Um, as we're framing them up, and obviously this is the first day, you know, it's still light out. Yeah, we do take breaks, you know, but <laughs> second day. Was there a prize at the end for if you get it done quicker? You know, we did have two teams. One team work on one side, one team work on the other side, and there was definitely some heavy competition. We had a crew of eight at that point, so I think there were like four, four um, so eight total people working on yeah. this. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Was this the third day? I think so. Is it often sunny in <laughs> Washington? Um, yeah, like all summer long. It's like a, <laughs> we have a drought every summer now. Um, And yeah, just noticing if it'd be neat if you had a stick frame house going along beside it because framers are fast. You know, they're not. It's not a slow part of the project um, in general. But you don't frame two houses this size in six days. He may is running away with it. Well, the roof setting we had one boom truck, so oh. we did. <laughs> we um, there you go. But we did all the roof panels on you know both houses in, in a long day. That's an info lot. Yeah, so it helped a lot to North go Seattle. fast. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what did you say? Is it a wet lot? An infill lot. Okay. What is that for? Well, an infill lot is it's an existing lot in an existing neighborhood, and I yeah. think we're in a place now where our neighborhoods have a lot tremendous value because they already exist. And if we can, you know, strengthen our neighborhoods by building new construction in them, yeah, um, that's very important. It was one of those places where there was a tiny little original farmhouse in the middle of a pretty huge piece of property, and it was a over 100-year-old building that was, you know, full of asbestos and mm -hmm. knob and tube wiring and falling down. So we started out that project with demoing the, the house and then um, getting the site ready to build those two places. So a team of eight, yeah. six days, start to finish. Six days, yeah. Getting it to where pretty much airtight. Yeah, yeah, ready for roofing and windows. Two houses, two stories. Yeah. 
What was the square footage of each of those, roughly? I think they were around 3,000 square feet apiece. Okay. So bigger houses by our standards, we do try to keep ourselves to smaller houses. But um, You're a two-story, so you went up. Yeah. So, so while it's fresh on your mind, you just saw that, and we'll get the, the microphone out if, if it's possible. Um, oh, good. Any questions that, from what you just saw on that video that you want to ask Ted about? I've got two here on, on that table. Just a question for Ted. Um, are, what are some of the challenges with building like a, an actual community of these homes? Uh, you know, I, I know that a lot of manufactured builders are building site-built homes for particular lots. I'm um, just curious about that. Uh, community. Well, the most we've done is two next to each other, and I'd say you gain a lot of efficiency. I mean, I'm sure production builders know this, but you gain a huge amount of efficiency by being able to build right next door. I mean, we use the same sets of tools and the same um, same boom truck and the same, you know, just being able to jump from one to another. And even in, in our practice, we're, we're building six houses this year. Um, they're in different areas, but we're able to jump our subcontractors just from one house to the next to the next. So. Is it just about um, buying land and, 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 and the business model primarily hasn't evolved to that type of? No, we haven't got there yet. Um, yeah. that's, that's our next hope is to be able to buy land and build some spec projects. We've done exactly one um, since the downturn, which is a whole different story. Thank you. I think there's another question at that same table. <coughs> yeah, I was just wondering, what's the typical weight of one of those 4 by 8 panels? The typical? Sorry, I missed that. Typical weight. Oh, on a four by eight panel. Um, generally speaking, they're they're roughly around five pounds per square foot. Um, the wall panels, like you saw in the video here, um, for the most part, can be manhandled. Um, sometimes just one person can tilt up a panel. You're not you're not physically like actually lifting it up here, kind of sliding it up against the, bo the bottom plate and tilting it up. So for wall applications, um, it can be handy to have some sort of mechanical equipment there, heavy header panels, for example. But for the most part, uh, it can be done manually. For roof panels, you definitely need to have some sort of equipment. Uh, it can be, I like little cranes the best because the crane parks in one spot and can do the entire roof from that one spot. But um, some people do them with the uh, zoom booms or the great all type, anything with the boom that can reach. They're a little bit more difficult to deal with, though, because you're constantly having to move the, the machine into position. We set our roofs with a 5K telehandler with a boom Yeah. Um, until we found the Army guys. And now we can set them with, with a with army guys, uh, <laughs> you got enough help, and yeah. you've got some some tall people. Um, I think one of the one of the advantages of doing the SIP roof is actually you can get it right up on the roof and start working on it. You don't need to, you know, you you should be tied off and everything and be safe, yeah. but you don't need to walk all over an open frame. I think there's a huge safety um, factor in in building like that because you, you know, you don't have guys walking around on the tops of walls. We minimize the time spent on the roof quite a yeah. bit. Usually it's just me and one other guy for one day to do the entire roof. So the, just the amount of time up there yeah. is a lot less. Um, and is there one more question out there? Or Texas, maybe two? There's a couple more. Good. I don't know if it's helpful, but we usually have three to four people on site for framing walls and then a full crew of like six or seven for doing roofs. Because sometimes you do need to manhandle those individual panels or person handle, you know, and having six people, you spread the weight. I mean, the biggest panels are, what, 600 pounds? Yeah, the biggest panel, you know, they can come up to 8 feet wide and 24 feet long. Um, without any additional uh, lumber material around, the, any plate material in them, just the panels themselves, they're, they're closer to 4 pounds a square foot. So, you know, 192 square feet times 4 pounds, you're almost 800 pounds. So. Yeah. Um, lifting a jumbo panel, you know, obviously you, you'd need several people. Um, and if you're doing roof panels, to have some kind of equipment to help, definitely. Yeah, if you have to handle them by person, if you have six people, then you're only like 150 pounds a piece. And so you That's can, right. you it's can, reasonable you, you to can move them around. Okay, question out here. Can they be manufactured for a taller ceiling heights? Manufactured for, sorry? 
yeah. all ceiling heights. Well, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what they are manufactured for. Um, typically, SIP roof systems are, uh, the, the panels are put on top of uh, exposed glue lamb beams or timber rafters. Um, so you've got, they're, for, they're meant for vaulted ceilings. You're actually eliminating the trusses. Is that what you... No, it's actually referencing like in a two-story structure on the first floor. You can have any wall height you want. I mean, you can do you can do a panel sideways and you end up with an eight-foot wall. Yeah. Or you can stand them up to get a nine-foot or ten-foot or twenty-four-foot high wall. And, and so, are you asking yeah. on well, we saw the two stories? The 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 floor for the second story was that a sip? Is that what you're asking? Right. Yeah. Oh. And what? Um, well, it, I, well, I'm, so you can, okay. You, can you ultimately get a nine-foot first-floor ceiling? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like the panels. Generally, as I mentioned earlier, they start out at eight by twenty-four feet, and we cut the the individual pieces out of those panels. So, if you have a ten-foot ceiling, for example, a typical wall panel would be four feet wide by ten feet high. You can actually sometimes even balloon frame. So, if you do have a two-story building, you potentially there, there's some engineering that has to be looked at, but uh, in theory, you you can uh, balloon frame. All the way up with with a single panel up to 24 feet high. Other questions out there? One here at this table, and then we're going to move on. My question is more of a remodel question. I know we were talking about new build right now. My understanding of a SIPS house is everything comes prefab, so you have your raceways built in for anything like that, right? For electrical, how hard are those to move, and can you cut panels in the field? Is that suggested, or should you have new ones made? So my question is: Let's say, for example. You want to put an electric door lock in that wasn't there before. You had a standard Baldwin lock, just everybody uses it. And then you, now you want an IoT system to open up your door when you have your hands mm -hmm. full. How hard is that raceway to build in, or does it have to be put on top, under the cladding outside? How does that work? Do you want to answer that one? Sure, yeah. The electric door locks that I've put in just go in the same holes that the regular door locks go in. Yeah, I would, um, I would say, you know, it's what, actually what, there's I, wiring involved that you have to run to that doorway now. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Um, it the panels that are there will typically have some sort of grid pattern of horizontal and electrical chases built into the panels. So, if you can use an existing chase to pull your wire through that. Typically, they're completely unobstructed. So, you know, if you if you can use an existing chase, then it's actually quite easy. In some ways, it's easier to do than a stick frame house because with a stick frame house, you'd have to at least cut out the drywall. And even if you were just feeding it through along with the same wires, here you don't have to cut out the drywall. If you can find a place to start, um, you can pull right through. If it's If it's like low voltage and it can't be... Uh, it has to be sort of separated from the higher voltage. That might be a little trickier. There, there are ways to do it, but that might be a little bit more. Uh, I think it's something from kind of a design and engineering perspective. When we did our first house, we good segue. Yeah, we did our first house. We uh, we furred out our walls um, because we uh, we were using sips that had that had um, studs in them and. Uh, Actually, going into that house, the electrician that, that did that, that and actually the H, HVAC sub as well uh, were commercial um, people, and they, they knew exactly what to do. They sort of put everything together, like in the middle of the house, they used the, the kind of ceiling, kind of frame down spaces for everything. And actually, the systems on the outside of the house were really, really minimized, and I, that just you know made me think of how yeah, everyone always wants to know, well, what about the wiring in the exterior walls? And it's like... You might, you know, there's like one cable that kind of zips around, and then the kitchen is a little different. But um, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's that big of a deal. It's something that can be designed. Well, and that's the thing. Oh, sorry, with, with panels, you know, this type of prefabrication, um, the importance of the design and engineering, and in, and in this case, the design, it really does have to be thought out um, before. Either, before you know or during the design phase of the of of the project and ideally you want to keep as much of the electrical out of the exterior walls as possible anyways i mean even you if you already do it with plumbing yeah you know you, not a good place to put your systems right you, you typically you're not going to have any plumbing in an exterior wall 
And even in a typical conventionally framed stick frame building, uh, if you really pay attention and look around, there's only a certain portion of the electrical on the exterior walls. So with, with prefabrication and SIPs in particular, if you can get it all out of the walls and keep, keep the electrical to partition, interior partition walls, all the better. You know, keep, keep it down to a minimum because you're just um, um, inviting air leakage and things that you have to go back and deal with later. So uh, the less, the better. If you do need to go back later, I mean, you guys, I know, give us a plan that shows exactly where those electrical chases are. And so we get, you know, di you know, building a new house, we get to tinker with that and say, okay, we want one nine inches from either side of every exterior door, and we want one here, and we want one there. And, um, but if you were an owner of an existing SIPS house that was built, you know, within the last 10 years or so, you'd probably be able to go back to those original panel drawings and see exactly where those chases are. I know we give each homeowner a homeowner's manual with a complete set of plans on a thumb drive. So in any of our houses, if you were going to go in and remodel, would have that information. You know, so they'd know where the, all the chases were, so you could hit one pretty easily. Mm -hmm.